Welcome to the Tax Talk Podcast, an exciting mini-series with Stefan Van Zanten. Mm -hmm. Stefan has been a private wealth advisor with Bridgeline Wealth since 2020. He focuses his time working with families, private corporations, estates, and family farms. He's always learning and educating himself to better serve his clientele, and particularly likes helping people navigate the complexities of estate matters and planning for the next generation. Stefan, just want to say thanks for helping yeah. on the podcast today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. You got it. Looking forward to this mini series. We've got three episodes that we're going to be putting out today. We are touching base on what does an estate administrator do? I know this comes up a lot in my practice and yours. Mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of unknowns that people are not aware of when they take on this responsibility yeah. and we just want to get a bit of information out there if you are already signed up as an administrator are considering taking this role on for somebody just to understand the complexities of it the responsibilities of it you know some of the timelines involved with it and just uh, better uh, better be informed mm -hmm. to uh, to be able to navigate what can be a very complex and, and difficult situation. Yeah. Perfect. So first question I wanted to kind of look at is who can be an administrator of an estate? Yeah, so that's a good, good question. Um, so you get two people or two entities that can be um, uh, representative of the estate. Uh, you can have the, the person who's been named in a will or you can have a trust company. Mm -hmm. So either one will be just fine. And uh, just on the language, when we talk about, uh, you hear lots of terminologies, for instance, executor, executrix, administrator of an estate. Um, here in Alberta, they just uh, changed that a little while ago to representative, uh, personal representative. So sometimes you'll see the language shortened down to simply PR. Hmm. Um, so personal representative, but that would be the answer to that that question there for who can be a personal representative perfect so I guess in touching on that you would mention either an individual can or perhaps a trust company mm -hmm. so is there maybe some sort of guidelines to say you know maybe in this situation an individual yeah. is fine or maybe in this situation I might want to look at a trust company as my administrator yeah that's a good question so so if you have assets under a million dollars, you should be able to navigate that with a good professional team around you uh, where you're not having to pay, pay uh, a trust company um, additional funds to, to do your job for you, essentially. So if you have, uh, if you're dealing with companies that are across the provinces, if you have companies outside of Canada, then yeah, I definitely would want to, to have that encouraging conversation to say, hey, listen, you should probably talk to um, a trust company about helping you with this, especially when with assets over net assets. Okay. So after costs are paid out, you're, you're sitting over, I'd say one to $2 million. That's where I'd start having that conversation, so. No, that makes sense. I think as that estate grows in complexity it probably warrants having that trust company on side to be able yeah. to kind of help navigate some of those complexities mm -hmm. i think also important if you are going to appoint an individual probably a good idea to have that person residing in the same province that you do yeah. to kind of avoid any legal hiccups down the road um, you know, if you are required to file a trust return, you know, an estate return, um, it's just a lot easier to have you know, maybe the beneficiaries and that administrator in that same province to avoid certain residency uh, issues with, with that estate as well. And then I guess, you know, on the, the offset chance, Maybe it's not offset, probably happens more often than we think. Mm -hmm. If someone doesn't have that will and hasn't appointed anyone as their administrator, then what happens? 
Well, I just want to cycle back just to sure. the when we're talking about the outer province for mm -hmm. personal representative. I think it's also important for you to understand why it's best to have someone who is in province to take care of that. Uh, if they're out of province, the individuals, it's going to add some complexities. It takes a lot of time mm -hmm. to actually manage a state. Uh, it's about 60 months on average for an estate to be finalized and for the CRA clearance certificate to be issued. Um, about 570 hours is the estimated average for 250,000 in the estate. 570 hours. So what that involves is the, the uh, representative is going to perhaps go to the bank or have to go meet with the investment advisor or have to go check on the properties. Um, they're going to have to maintain businesses as well uh, while the estate is being processed and going through probate. So when we're thinking about the involvement of time and we add in travel, that's going to be an issue. But then on top of that, the courts are concerned that someone outside of the province uh, may walk away with some of the money mm. and creditors not be able to go outside of their jurisdiction mm. to get funds. And then when we add someone who's, if it's not already complex enough, but if we add someone who's now living in Jamaica, mm -hmm. now we've got some tax issues, right. and which you could speak to, but one of those tax issues would, would be that the estate would be missing out on the privileges of, of taxes here in Alberta. Right. Because the representative, um, the estate could potentially be taxed now in Jamaica, um, as opposed to getting the tax privileges of Alberta. Not to mention now you have to communicate with the the mm -hmm. banks and the uh, investment companies, and they may not want to hear from someone who's a non-resident. Right. So. There's a lot of complexities involved and that's where you'd want to pick your PR carefully. No, that's yeah. a good point. I think reducing the complexities in your estate plan and your will, I think probably benefits everybody that's involved yeah. with it. You know, it keeps the fees down, probably keeps tensions among your family down as best as possible as yeah. well. So. Keeping all these things in line is, is going to benefit a lot of people upon your passing, for sure. I'm curious, is anything else you want to add to the, the tax side of things? Um, I'm just kind of working on one right now. It is a bit of a complex item where a client that was a Canadian resident passed away. Both of the beneficiaries are down in the U.S. There was some property left over upon passing. So having to deal with now the estate returns, the selling of the properties, paying out the eventual funds to non-residents, the you know, determination of the residency of that trust, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, in that particular situation, there was maybe not a great way to avoid it, just based on the family dynamic. You know, both the boys are living down in the States and, and mom has them both as, as the PRs uh, on the will. So, you know, maybe there might have been a family friend that could have taken care of it up here, or maybe, you know, a trust company, although the estate probably didn't warrant that type of, right, right. you know, intercession there. But, you know, We'll, we'll get it figured out. We'll get the, the proper paperwork yeah. filed. But yeah, there is a lot that goes into it to ensure that you've got all the proper you know, tax documents filed, all the proper withholdings filed, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, having you know this type of thing all pre-planned is helpful. And then also reviewing it on a regular basis yeah. because you, know, you might appoint one or two people at some juncture in your life and at some point they they might move or they're otherwise incapable of doing that job as the PR down the road and then your plan that you came up with via the will might not be of any value down the road. Yeah. So. so so continue to to circle back to that will and make sure that mm -hmm. uh, the PR is 
is not floating around. If uh, you, if you <laughs> selected a, a wandering PR, <laughs> maybe reevaluate that. Uh, someone like if they like to move around, think about someone who's consistent um, here. Will uh, IRS uh, want to have a clip of that? Um, will they want some tax dollars? I haven't quite got to that point yet. Um, they always seem to be s sniffing around a little bit. Yeah, it, it's looking based on this particular case that the trust will be a deemed resident of Canada and pay taxes here. I'll have to review the tax treaty. I would presume there should be some offset there, but again, yeah. you know, some complications. Good, so the trust that, is, in, is in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So, perfect. Right on. So, next question How do I choose the right PR? Well, it's, it's a good segue. Yep. <laughs> uh, make sure they're not a wandering yep. PR, make sure that they have. Uh, they're reliable, they're trustworthy, um, you know, look at their life. Are they successful at their careers? Do they get along with the family? Do they get along with people? I would say don't just pick someone based off of the fact that they're the oldest sibling, they're the oldest uh, child that you have. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that the, the PR position is, is a place of honor. Um, I would I would probably say it's a lot of responsibility. That's how it should be looked at. And uh, with proper communication to the rest of the beneficiaries, I think that you could have things move smoothly. And don't just choose someone because they're your best friend, you feel like you owe them something. Uh, if they're not competent, unfortunately, it could be devastating to the family um, and to the beneficiaries. So make sure that they are reliable, confident, and compliment uh, and also have time mm -hmm. they have the ability to to put in the time as we alluded to about 570 hours on average it's, it's quite a bit so that. yeah no I think that's a good point you know when you're appointing that individual on that time basis you know maybe it's a, an older individual looking to update the will you probably don't want your elderly brother or something on there anymore because you know, you just don't necessarily know if when you pass, you're going to have the same amount of time that the brother's going to be able to then contribute to that yeah. estate because it can take, you know, like you mentioned, 16 months on average, if not longer, depending on the complexities of it, to get that estate wrapped up. So that's an important factor to, to mention. I think you also kind of touched on, you know, not just appointing someone out of good graces, but actually finding someone that is competent to do it. And it's not that you need to, you know, find an accountant or find a lawyer or someone that has a specific career in this field, mm -hmm. but maybe more so someone that's, you know, very detail oriented, someone that's maybe a good quarterback and is able to say, okay, well, these are the steps we have to take. I'm gonna go here, I gotta go here, and then just starts knocking off this to-do list because it, it gets to be quite extensive. But if you kind of got that guy that is is in the Volkswagen van traveling the country and you <laughs> yeah. know, he's loving life, but he might not be the he most- He has a beneficiary yeah, and that's- Yeah, he might not be the most reliable guy to, to shut off the water and the yeah. gas at your place. So. Yeah, yeah, well said. It, and uh, for, for us, uh, we, we deal with, uh, you know, folks that have unfortunately uh, had a loved one pass away and they are named executors or they're trustees and they come into our offices and uh, they actually do a really good job. Um, and what we do is we just sit with the checklist and we make sure that we have standing appointments to help them stay on track. And uh, we find that that works really, really well. So I think uh, there's a lot of people that if they set their mind to it, they do have the abilities and, and skills and responsibility to, to do it and uh, do a great job. So just surround yourself with a great team. For sure. And I think lastly on the appointing of that PR is within the will, not just to have one individual, 
because you might go sign that will and you know the intent is not to have to come in there every six months or a year to update it if you only have one person in there they happen to pass away mm -hmm. or they become incapacitated yeah. for whatever reason you're going to have no one there to take care of your affairs should that state come up so to me it's always important to have you know multiples have an alternative depending on you know the size of the estate and maybe who's involved as a PR, it might be best to have three or an odd individ, you know, number of individuals there. That way, you've got the power to kind of, you know, two versus one veto and make some decisions mm -hmm. to move things along, so you don't get stuck in these stalemates that might end up having to be pushed into a court situation to get yeah. resolved. So, I think that's an important thing to consider yeah. too. Yeah, that's. I mean, I look at my life, and um, you know, we had. Uh, I was the the backup. And uh, you know, through unfortunate circumstances, now I'm the primary, mm. and um, it's it, life happens, oh, it and so you just having that backup is uh, is nice. As soon as you're making your will, uh, the question should be asked by the lawyer: uh, Would you also like to have a backup PR? And uh, the answer should be yes. Mm. For sure. Perfect. So, in general, what are some of the duties of that PR yeah so I, I have to reference uh, some notes here so, <laughs> uh, so it's going to be locating the testator's assets um, paying the funeral costs from the testator's assets applying to the court for a grant of probate if one is needed and paying the testator's debts and taxes uh, also from the estate and then distributing the money and property, if any, according to the will. So that is it summed up right there. For sure. Right there. So I think as a whole, I kind of like to look at them three kind of broad topics. So one is to kind of act in the best interest mm -hmm. of the beneficiaries. So like you say, you know, taking care of things in a timely manner paying for those funeral expenses mm -hmm. and making sure that that gets done in a timely basis to honor that individual and their family. Taking care of, you know, closing out accounts and, mm -hmm. and dealing with those items. I think that's an important thing. Safeguarding assets. I mean, it's, you know, say it's the, the single uh, widow that's passed on and, you know, no one's there to, to look after the house, etc. now. She was the last one to pass. It's important to you know maintain the property and maintain these assets to ensure, again, that you're safeguarding the interests of those beneficiaries because you want to be able to preserve the value that's inherent in those assets, so you can eventually you know liquidate those or transfer those to the beneficiaries, and they can get you know maximum value out of those items as possible. And and just to add to that. Uh you know, as the, as the PR, your job is to make sure that the assets are protected as well. And that means even protected from beneficiaries. <laughs> so or beneficiaries or people who feel entitled to certain memorabilia mm -hmm. that's left within the, the home. Let's say, say, for instance, we've heard it lots of times, you have a home, uh, the testator passes away, um, now you're the PR. And, and you hear that people are going into the house or the home of the deceased and they're walking out with, with pictures and memorabilia and valuables saying that, oh, this was promised to me uh, by, by dad. And you know what? It's your responsibility to make a, make a note of all assets protect them and so I would say if you're the PR you should immediately go home change the locks before anyone does anything like that because you'll have to go track down those those things especially if they're listed in the will and uh, that's gonna be a lot of a lot of drama in the family that could be avoided so you have to know this that you are responsible and you can't just roll over and let people take stuff uh, which is oftentimes the case 
and it gets people into a lot of hot water. So one thing to avoid, change the locks. Yeah, and that can be a very tricky situation because, you know, on one side you have the beneficiaries pushing to, you know, maybe get a hold of some of these mm -hmm. items, but at the same point in time, you know, maybe some of the items need to be dealt with through probate or maybe some of them are, you know, taxable, you know, and we need to make sure that we're dealing with all this stuff in an appropriate manner to ensure that you're not distributing some of that estate before time and uh, therefore making yourself liable for any taxes. And, and that kind of parlays into kind of the last one that I always like to, to look at is, you know, just making sure that that PR is always representing and respecting the wishes mm -hmm. yeah. that are laid out in that will. You know, that will is probably the last document that someone has to, to transfer you know, their last wishes onto their family. And it's important for that PR to, to respect that and to, you know, enact it. Like you said, if people are coming and going and taking things, well, maybe this particular heirloom was earmarked for, you know, the oldest daughter. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you got someone else pressuring you to, to take that off, the, off your hands, you know, you're not going to be respecting that will and getting that heirloom to, to where it was intended to go. And then you might have some liability coming back on you down the road from that yeah, eldest sure. dollar. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it, it can put you in a real sticky position because sometimes these things take a long time to resolve. You've got the beneficiaries kind of breathing down your neck to get it done. But at the same time, you just have to wait for you know the court system and CRA to process things, and it, it can be tricky. But I think that's the most important thing mm -hmm. is, is to know that you are acting on behalf of that individual that has passed. That is your most important yeah. role in the whole process. And that's called a fiduciary uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So that you're going to come across the terminology, but when you say yes to being a PR. Um, which you can't, you don't have to say yes to, we'll, we'll get to that later mm -hmm. on. But if you say yes, then you're also taking on a fiduciary responsibility, meaning that you are gonna think about the best interests of the beneficiaries first, mm -hmm. above all else. That goes with your time, the way you think about things, the way you uh, place investments, if you have investments. Um, so just that fiduciary responsibility, um, which you'll be coming across. In, in, in writing so if you're unsure especially when it comes to do I can I hand out this this five dollar picture most likely that's probably gonna be okay but if you're unsure go talk to the lawyer that's working on the case with you just for clarification yeah. Yeah, that's a good point keeping those advisors in the loop yep. as to what you're doing and, and where you know funds are or you know certain assets from the estate are going to would, would probably save you a lot of headache in the long run should you uh, put something up there that you weren't <laughs> supposed to. So I know you had kind of mentioned a few things that the administrator kind of did in conjunction with their duties. Mm -hmm. And I know based on kind of looking at some of the checklists that you have, materials that we have in the firm here as well, mm -hmm. It is a fairly substantial laundry list of things that a PR could potentially have to do. But if we kind of just touch into some of the more key items, I guess, on the task list that that PR is kind of responsible for completing or taking care of. Sure, yeah. Okay, so there's going to be four kind of main responsibilities. Just think of it this way. Identify the, the estate uh, assets and debts. So you're going to identify estate assets and debts. Uh, two, administer and manage the estate. Three, pay the debts of the estate. And four, distribute the accounts uh, until it's complete. So going back to number one, identify the estate and assets and debts. So that means list contents in the security box. Uh, all property owned by testator, the bank accounts, the real estate, the belongings, you're gonna kind of add that all up. And, and then you're also gonna add all the debts. So all the debts that are there, and then you're going to find out whether the estate has money or it doesn't. 
And then who knows, maybe you'll have to send out a letter to tender uh, out to the general public, uh, put something in the, in the newspaper mm -hmm. just stating, hey, listen, this is so-and-so passed away. If you have debts, uh, please notify us and, uh, and make sure that that goes well. Hopefully there's no surprises. Administrator, administer, administer and manage the estate. So that would be communicate with the beneficiaries. That's your job, keep them up to date on what's going on and they appreciate not being left in the dark. Contact insurance companies about the testator's death. Uh, manage, protect and secure estate property as we mentioned, like changing locks. True. Keeping the business operating. So you still wanna keep, if businesses are, if, if the deceased had businesses, uh, you're not just going to shut shut down a shop. There's right. going to be a process to that. So you want to keep those operating, as you alluded to. Sure. Uh, the value still needs to be uh, there and probably growing at the rate that it was. Mm -hmm. um, consolidated accounts, maintain insurance policies, and maintain land and storing belongings. So that would kind of be the second point. Sure. Third, pay the debts of the estate. So file and pay income tax. So that's where they come to see you. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Uh, arrange for debtors such as mortgages, loans, credit cards, and expenses to be paid. Um, and there's a process. I think there's there, there's a safe way to do it. Debtors want to get paid like this and they're afraid they're not going to get paid. But you also have responsibility to the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, I'll put a pause here, and this is why it's so important to do a safe planning because the debtors don't really care about beneficiaries. That's correct. They just want to get paid. Uh, whereas we're concerned about how are the assets going to be dispersed and how is the next generation going to benefit from those assets? Um, and I think there's a proper way to do it. For sure. But according to the responsibility of the PR, when it comes down to it, your, your responsibilities lie here. Um, I would be talking previous to right. passing. For sure. Distribute and account for, that's the fourth, find and notify all beneficiaries noted in the will. Inform any joint tenancy uh, beneficiaries, inform any beneficiaries outside of the will as well, sure. uh, such as life insurance beneficiaries, um, RRSP beneficiaries, TFSA beneficiaries, uh, manage any trusts, and just distribute the estate property according to the instructions in the will. So that that would just be a, a <laughs> tiny, tiny little piece, but right. kind of on a macro scale. Yeah. Uh, looking down is the responsibility of the, the PR. And, and done well, wonderful. You, uh, you've done something that very few people <laughs> have done well. <laughs> so yeah, I would say anything, any comments on that? I think that's a good summary overall, and I think you know you can sit here and rattle that off in five-ish minutes. Yeah. But when you start talking thanks, about thanks for staying for that long, <laughs> that was dry content. <laughs> it, it's important content, though. And yeah. what I wanted to kind of allude to is you could go through that in five minutes, and it doesn't seem like it's that bad. But when you're starting out. You know, maybe you've obtained that will and that death certificate. You're just getting into this process until that final point where you've got that cleared certificate and you can distribute, you know, the assets. Like you mentioned before, on average, 16 months. So it's a long haul. And I think speaking from experience, clients that I've dealt with, there's always some wrinkle that comes up too that... You know, as, as well as you might be prepared and expecting to deal with all this, there's always something that comes up that, you know, makes things a little bit more challenging than you would have hoped for. Um, so I think it's, like you said, it's always important to have that estate plan in place long beforehand. I think a big one that, you know, I would see as a, a vitally important piece is for that business owner yeah. to have that plan mm -hmm. in place. Because like you say, depending on the business, he or she might be a big chunk of that. Mm -hmm. And if you just take them out of there, there's gonna be a big hole left in that business. And 
there could be a lot of value to that data passing, but if that business implodes after the fact, oh, yeah. you know, it, it could be very detrimental in the fact that, you know, the business is going to be valued at fair market when that individual passes, but maybe you don't get through this process for 16 mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. The business creators over that time, you owe a whole pile of taxes via the estate, and now maybe you don't have the the assets to kind of cover some of that stuff off you know you're you're left with maybe resorting some more complex tax planning strategies at that point to be able to use up losses accordingly so it, it's always important not just from that pr standpoint but from that business owner standpoint to have all that planning in place long beforehand to ensure that you know they're able to preserve their legacy you know, both financially as well as that family dynamic going forward. So I think those were kind of the big points for me on that. Yeah, sure. yeah, that's 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 really big. And you know, when we're doing estate planning and we're talking about um, uh, families that have uh, a, a good amount of, of money, there will be taxes, uh, especially if it's jumping now from spouse to the benefit to the next generation. Right. Um, so the question you have to ask is how are we planning to uh, avoid capital get capital losses or how are, are we avoiding uh, taxes or how are we mitigating the taxes I should say avoiding taxes mm -hmm. how are you mitigating taxes for instance uh, uh, families with uh, a large real estate portfolio now it skips this, now the this last spouse passes away and we have some tax issues that have to be dealt with and and there is good plans that can be set in motion that can help you uh, pass money on to the next generation. But at this point, it's it's now you're just dealing with the fallout, so it's too late to, mm -hmm. to make changes. Uh, so you want to be thinking ahead of time, so exercising options. And I think a piece of that planning ahead would be talking to Stefan to say, you know, this is what we have set up currently maybe there is a way that we can bring some life insurance into this mm -hmm. scenario to yeah. maybe offset some of that capital gains mm -hmm. tax or the terminal tax return and uh, just ensuring that you planned ahead that way you know maybe you need to divide assets in a certain mm -hmm. way that's going to help that uh, estate be able to mitigate some of that and you know that is something that you could do for that PR in advance to make their job a lot easier. Oh, yeah. You know, if, you, if you've done all this planning, you have that life insurance in place, that covers off the tax, maybe it equalizes things, the business flows mm -hmm. to one, you know, child, and then the, the excess life insurance funnels to the other, mm -hmm. everybody moves on, everyone's happy. Then you've set that PR up to do a good job, not to have to navigate all these pitfalls of poor planning ahead of time. Because like we mentioned earlier, they're just kind of executing your wishes as laid out in that yeah. will. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have anything you know, well planned out there, if you don't have a will at all, it's going to be difficult. Listen, if you don't have a will at all, get a will. Get a will. Get a Please, will. get a will. And then, and then for you people out there that have had a Last seen a will, your will updated 10 years ago. A lot changes. Yes. Update the will. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Without that will in place, you know, that PR yeah. is going to be left old in the bag and have a very hard time. Because, I mean, that adds a whole other complexity and time aspect to it. If, you know, you pass without a will, intestate, then it's got to go through the courts. You've got to get a court-appointed administrator, and you know I'm working on one right now, and mm -hmm. it, it's time-consuming, and it becomes very challenging to then be able to track down all the pieces to be able to start putting this estate together and say, okay, this is the first return that we got to deal with, and then we can kind of move from here. And then we find a whole bunch of new hurdles that yeah. kind of come into play. And what happens to the kids, right? Like if exactly. you don't have a will, then then you are eventually putting your kids in the hands of the government yep. to be uh, cared for, and then for a third party to decide what to do with your your assets. For sure. So. Yeah, when we're talking legacy, a will is a big part of that. 
Yeah. It built that well. It is. It's, it's just one of the keystones. Yeah. yeah. There's no way to pass that legacy on effectively. So I know this is one that comes up for some of my clients on a regular basis. As a PR, am I able to be paid for my time that I put in for 60 months and 500 plus hours? This is sucking up a lot of my life. Yeah. yeah. I want to be compensated. Yes. Can I be? Is it a smart idea? Yeah. What do you think? Okay, so there is a couple options. Uh, it's not a law that the PR has to be paid, but it is a general accepted practice. Mm -hmm. um, and that set out, uh, where is that set out? It's uh, Alberta Executor Fee Guidelines. And so this is often referred to by the courts. Um, and so for the first 250,000, I think it's three to 6%. Mm -hmm. Um, that you could be entitled for. Um, after that, it falls down to about two to four percent, or actually uh, two to four percent, and then uh, beyond that, it's 0.5 to four percent. And so that's just on the first set. And then there's three other areas where you could get compensated, okay. carrying on uh, here based on revenue, estate care and management, and compensation for other work. So yes, you can, but the question is. Is there a better way? So I look at this because it's going to cause some drama. Yeah, the the beneficiaries <laughs> are going. Hey, what are you doing? You, you're taking all of our money. That's a you just made ten thousand dollars off of our backs. Right. Well, you actually should have been making a lot more than that. <laughs> but sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's a good point. So I kind of look at it from two different sides of view. So. If you are appointed a PR, but you're also a beneficiary mm -hmm. of that will, to me, it's redundant in a lot of ways mm -hmm. to be taking compensation, especially if you're the sole beneficiary. Yeah, good point. You're just you know, pulling from his pocket to put it in his other pocket. In the meantime, that estate then, if they're going to pay you compensation, is going to need to register for a payroll account and remit the applicable source deductions on those monies. So if you're the sole beneficiary, you're just giving CRA part of the residue mm -hmm. of the estate, so it makes no sense. If it is, you know, you as the PR, maybe you have two or three siblings involved as well, that is probably where it gets to be probably the trickiest because you're probably putting in a lot of time to maybe clean up mom's estate. Mm -hmm. Maybe the other three siblings have no involvement in it. And that's typically the case. Yeah, like it, there's is. One, it is. There's one beneficiary that's going, hey, I'm going to be responsible. And the other one is, you know, maybe that maybe they have some legitimate reason. Maybe they're ill. Maybe yep. they have some, some issues going on. Or, or maybe, unfortunately, mm -hmm. they're, they're just going, I'm overwhelmed and I don't yep. have anything to do with it. And then they're trying to track down signatures. Yeah, I mean, I, I dealt with a family over tax season in this exact situation. One individual kind of led the charge on taking care of everything. A couple of the other ones helped out here and there, but it was, it was mostly on the shoulders of the one individual. It worked really well for that family. They got along really well. It's probably a tough one. I think if you were going to have that conversation, it's probably good to have it early on as opposed to going down the road, spending those 16 months, and then at the end of it, when you're trying to do this final disposition, oh, hey, by the way, I want an extra XXX because I put in however many hours. That might ruffle some feathers, but if you have that conversation ahead of time, you know, maybe that's something that's going to save that family dynamic. Now, I think if you are dealing with a situation where you have been listed as the PR, but you're not a beneficiary of the will, I think you should then be compensated for your time. Yeah. Because beyond that, you're just doing this out of the good graces of your heart. Depending on where you are in life, your career, and your family, you might be taking up a significant amount of your time for a couple of years, and I think it is probably yeah, within the wishes. Couple of years, yeah, yeah within think? the wishes of that individual that passed away, yeah. that they would like to see you yeah. be compensated for the time. That's why 
you know, they appointed you because they thought you were capable of that mm -hmm. job. You should be compensated in return for that. So again, have that conversation up front, I think is important. But that situation, that makes sense to me. And, and adding to that, um, for a testator, someone who is uh, making their will, I would suggest looking at, there's one other option that you could look at, and it would be utilizing a segregated fund where you can, uh, without it going through probate and open to the other beneficiary's eyes, you just slip that money into the, the, the hands of the uh, beneficiary for the list, who's the listed PR, and then you don't have to worry about the whole situation. Um, utilizing the segregated fund is just going to be an investment piece. You're going to list the beneficiary, it's going to be the PR, and you have that money go to them upon your passing. And they're compensated, they'll be taken care of while they take care of uh, managing your estate. I think that's a good point. You kind of avoid the whole thing. Yeah, because even if you were to have some of these discussions up front, yeah. it's probably not one of the things that you would like to do within a week of, oh, okay, mom passed, let's talk about how, how gonna we're going to compensate right. <laughs> my time for the next two years. You know, that's just not a conversation that anybody's looking no, to have. No. So yeah, if you have it set up that way, again, planning ahead, yeah, totally. having these pieces in play, you help out that PR, you preserve yeah. their relationships with the beneficiaries, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's what I call a win-win-win. For sure. Mike Scott. Perfect. All right. I know you had briefly, briefly mentioned this before, but can I turn down an appointment as a PR? Yes. So yes, you can. Um, you can turn down an appointment as a PR. Uh, it's best to do it sooner than later. Uh, what it would be involving is uh, as soon as you get presented the fact that you are the PR. Um, and the testator's living, and you feel uncomfortable about it, <laughs> after listening to this, <laughs> sorry, uh, you could just simply say, uh, thank you, I feel honored, but I don't feel like I am up to the task, and, and you, you just avoided two years. If you discover that you are the listed PR uh, upon the passing of the, the uh, testator, then you can just put in a, a form to the courts uh, saying that you would like to uh, uh, pretty much link, relinquish your duty and that's that should be as far as that goes if you've said yes and you're halfway through uh, administrating the state then what the courts are expecting is an accounting for all your uh, everything that you charge to the estate they want to see as well the the assets, the liabilities, mm -hmm. a full presentation and accounting for, and then it's up to the courts to decide whether or not they will release you from your duties. So you don't even get to decide. It. <laughs> <laughs> but that is why I say the sooner the better if you're right. not up to the task. Right. Um, but I say for those who have said yes, just bring your best to the game. And I'll say it again, just surround yourself with the right professionals to, uh, to just amplify your abilities. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I think keeping that in mind, maybe saying no ahead of time, and understanding the fact that, you know, it's more than you're just trying to honor someone's, you know, wish for you to take on this role it's a lot more involved than just that. So mm -hmm. I think it would be better for yourself, it would be better for the testator, it would be better for the beneficiaries, it'd be better for everybody if you just, you, you can't do it for whatever reason. Yeah. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but just to say no up front before you get down this road that it, it becomes hard to kind of unwind that and, and pull back from it. So I think that's an important to keep in mind. And a self-awareness tip is if right. you are good at starting things but you're not good at completing things, <laughs> that could be a tip. You might not <laughs> be good PR material. <laughs> you like to you have a hundred projects on the go. You could be a great go. human being, right. 
but not in this role you, you need to start and then complete right so yeah. yeah and like we mentioned it takes that certain temperament and certain yeah. skill set to get through this yeah. you don't want the the wandering uh, Vida van traveler. <laughs> He's the nicest oh, guy oh, in the world. Picture but, up of that. Yeah, yeah, funny. Yeah. Uh, we just we don't want to rely on that individual no. to carry things through because it is a long and tedious task is, to get yeah. these finished up. Yeah. So I know we've kind of touched on you know good planning to date mm -hmm. and you know finding that PR that's gonna take on that responsibility, see this thing through. What happens if you know, all the plans are in place, we find that right PR, yeah. we get down six, eight, 10, whatever months into the, the estate process and the beneficiaries, for whatever reason, they don't think the PR is living up to his or her responsibilities. Yeah. Maybe they have a sense that the assets are disappearing. Maybe right. the assets are being used for the personal gain of that individual. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that the beneficiaries can bring legal recourse yeah. against that PR? So there is. Uh, I would I would tread cautiously through that because it could be at the end of the day probably a, could could be a waste of time mm -hmm. um, if you don't have good reasonable grounds okay. to to bring to the courts and say hey listen um, the PR is doing a, a terrible job we get this feeling that he's not doing his job well. The courts uh, enshrine testamentary, uh, your last will and, and, and testament, they, they really uh, guard that heavily. And so they want to make the best, they, they want to preserve the wishes of the testator. And so they may lean towards, well, if you don't have legal grounds, if you don't have evidence of there being wrongdoing, um, we, can, we can look at this, but it could just be a waste of time and, and cost you money right. if you're just going off of a feeling. But if you if you can kind of bring proof and evidence that they aren't doing their job and they are costing uh, the beneficiaries money, right. then you probably have a good case. But on that note, I would just again talk to your lawyer right. and see if there's uh, enough grounds to have that person to remove and replace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thing to keep in mind. I think the constant communication between mm -hmm. the beneficiaries and that PR, you know, it, it's a two-way street. So, you know, I, I think the beneficiaries need to take an active kind of role in the process as well, mm -hmm. not pressuring the PR to, to get things done ahead of time, but you know, consistently be asking for that accounting of the estate, you know, following up on items that, you know, that they know to be important and, you know, having some level of understanding themselves in the whole process and not just, you know, okay, it's the PR's mm -hmm. job, I'm going to sit back and you let me know in yeah. 24 or whatever months when I can have my money and yeah. until then I'll just <laughs> give you free reign to do it. So I think if, if you're involved as that beneficiary, you know, there's a probably a higher chance of, you know, accountability in that situation. And then maybe certain circumstances that could lead themselves to, you know, mismanagement of funds or, or just even the PR becomes overwhelmed and, you know, forgets to, to move some investments around and, and loses some money as a result of that. Maybe they invested them incorrectly into something that was oh gosh, too yeah. high risk or something like that. Yeah. You know, just keeping on top of these things and, you know, reviewing those estate statements and saying, well, you know, is this a good place for the money? You know, have you contacted, a, you know, an investment advisor mm -hmm. to, to ensure that while these funds are held in trust yeah. over the course of this period of time, that you know my interests are being protected so you know I, I think it falls back a bit on that beneficiary but yeah like you say there is there is some room for recourse mm -hmm. it's probably a bit difficult it's probably time-consuming yeah. and if you leave it to the very end there might be nothing left to recover depending on how things play out yeah so yeah. 
it's important, like everything, to kind of just plan ahead and, and take a bit of responsibility in the process. So. That, you know, at the end of the day, after the estate's been dispersed, this is two years of your life. Yeah, it's, it is a long time and money's involved. Um, so time and money are, are big factors too. That can put strain on relationships. Mm -hmm. But the reality is you're gonna be family well after uh, this has all been played out. And I would just strongly encourage you to, 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 to communicate um, and find ways to be helpful to the PR because they are saddled with a lot of responsibility. And the last thing that they need is uh, beneficiaries um, saying, when am I gonna get paid? Right. Um, I would just say this is a good opportunity to come together as a family. Um, that would be the wish of the testator. Um, so just just tread tread on that one on a relational end, and I think you can see some some wins that didn't have to go to court. Sure. Um, so yeah, I would say that. And the other thing I'd also say is like when when it comes to the length of time, it is a lengthy process. So again, there's mechanisms that uh, where funds can bypass probate, or you can have options where decisions could be made ahead of time prior to a full loss of the investments because right. uh, it's, a, it's a lengthy process yeah and, and like you said things can be lost and sometimes not yeah. due to the, the management of the, the yeah. PR. Yeah. So. yeah I think that's a good point and something that I like to bring up with my clients all the time is yes it's important to preserve that financial legacy but to me, you know, the family dynamic mm -hmm. and the legacy of the family itself is the most important part of it. You know, if that PR is able to maximize the returns on the investment over the course of 24 months, but, you know, the relationships between all the beneficiaries break down in the meantime, have we done a good job with this? I would say no. Yeah. I, I think it's more important, and like you mentioned, I think that testator would prefer to see that that family continue on, sit down for the Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, and keep you know those family moments alive and well long yeah, after they passed. Yeah. I think that's an important part of it. So, and, and I think that's maybe like a great conversation to have down the road is, you know, what what is good estate planning? What does that look like? Um, one one note I wanted to to just quickly make was uh, let's see if I I got it here testamentary freedom uh, I think we touched on this so testamentary freedom you have in Canada the ability to to kind of give direction as to where you want your assets to go right. when you pass um, and and that's enshrined in, that, in Canada but there's certain limitations to that. As free as we are as Canadians, there's certain limitations. For instance, if you wanted to have your assets go to a terrorist organization, it, no, no. that's probably not going to to be fulfilled. Right. Um, there was one interesting thing, uh, and it was it's where testamentary freedom verse uh, comes against public policy. Mm -hmm. And so, with, uh, in this case, there was uh, uh, a regular church goer. And this person to church all the time and he and his will wanted the house that he was selling or that was being dispersed to go to either a Presbyterian or an Anglican mm -hmm. and the courts ruled that it was against public policy mm -hmm. and it was here a judge determined that the will violated Human Rights Act that prohibits discrimination on the basis or religion in the purchase or sale of a property mm -hmm. so even as you're writing your will and we're on this topic uh, to keep that in mind because not all the wishes may be fulfilled. Perfect. Anything else you want to kind of mention on the PR side of things before we wrap it up? Yeah, I mean, the, the sooner that you're having your meetings uh, with your accountant um, and you're saying, hey, let's have some succession planning, let's have some estate planning, I think, uh, I think there's not you can't get any earlier to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And then when the, the first stop that you're going to have uh, as a PR 
uh, when the, the state is being dispersed is going to go to the lawyer's office. Mm -hmm. And then I'd probably say pop by the wealth advisor's office, uh, like ourselves or, or, or Jared, because it's not too early in that process to start gathering your team of professionals around you. To, even if you don't have all the ducks in a row, that will help you go, okay, what do I need to do in this situation? Because remember, we're talking, you know, 60,000 feet right. uh, above, and uh, you're dealing with the loss of someone that uh, you really love. Right. And so there's a lot of emotions, and it's nice to know that you've got people around you that are, are motivated to help you. So I would just say. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, that PR doesn't have to operate in a silo. Yeah, they don't have to yeah. figure out all the you know estate laws and the tax laws and yeah. how to invest funds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, you know, hopefully that testator has kind of put some of these advisors in place. Mm -hmm. If not, you know, definitely reach out to Stefan or myself, yeah. and then get those particular people on team as quickly as possible to yeah. to enable you to to perform mm -hmm. that that duty as best as possible. Yeah, perfect. Right thanks so much for having me. Yeah, for sure. Stefan, really want to say thanks for taking some time out to hop on the podcast. If people want to get a hold of you, what's the, the best way to do that? Uh, you can email me, uh, svanzanton at bridgelinewealth.ca. I think that might be in the show notes. It will be. Uh, you can also call our office. That will be in the show notes too. For sure. And uh, I'd love to hear hear from you and, and hear, um, you know, just kind of what's going on. If, if you have general questions, I'd be happy to to feed in. Uh, I'm just a wealth advisor, so I'm not a lawyer, mm -hmm. I'm not an accountant, I'm not here giving any legal advice, For sure. uh, but we are here to, to help out our weekend. So. Perfect. Yeah, I'll definitely put all that contact information in the show notes. Feel free to reach out to Stefan and uh, discuss any of these things uh, that we've kind of gone through on the podcast at any point in time. So for the Tax Talk Podcast, I'm Jared Pallon. Thanks again for listening. Take care, and we will talk soon. Ha, ha, ha.